Would you just lift up our world? Lift up our nation? Would you pray for all officials of our government, local, regional, state, national, international? Pray for our community, our neighbors here in New Brunswick, at Rutgers, Pray for our seminary, all students, staff, faculty, alumni, friends, and pray for yourselves, particularly any particular needs that are just pressing financial, social, systemic, environmental. Now would you breathe in fresh breath. Breathe out old worries. Breathe in new hope. Breathe out disappointment, devastation, despair. Breathe in grace. And now please extend grace to someone else. Good evening. Let us stand for our call to worship. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we come worshiping you and thanking you for this is a day that you have made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, we thank you for this day because we are standing here excited about new, excited for those that this is their first day in seminary, excited for those who have returned, excited for our professors that are here prepared to teach us, excited for the administration that is here with us. We ask, Lord, that you would be, continue to be with us, that you continue to show your grace and your mercy with us, and as we go through this semester and we would remember that this, this day of excitement, that we would return to this energy that you have given us. We ask your blessings on this service. We ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Remember that psalm when we get into the sermon. 
God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Some scriptures just fall off your tongue. Others need a little context to be understood. So I ask that you bear with me. We will unfold Jeremiah and his words in the midst of the sermon when the scripture comes along. But first, please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable unto thee, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. You see, the story started out really well. Jeremiah's ancestor, Abathar, was one of the priests in Jerusalem during the time of King David. It doesn't get any better than that. The family was one of the most important in Jerusalem, and life for the family was perfect, and everybody thought they were important. When King David neared his death, thoughts of those officials turned to his successor, Abathar, Jeremiah's ancestor, and many others assumed that the new king would be David's oldest son. But as always, there was trouble brewing in the palace. And the prophet Nathan and the high priest Zadok backed David's younger son, Solomon, And indeed, Solomon became the next king. Well, for Jeremiah's family, things went from bad to worse. Those who had backed the older brother were either killed or exiled by Solomon and his officials. Well, at least that ancestor of Jeremiah wasn't killed. He was simply exiled to his ancestral lands in Anathoth outside Jerusalem. And there the family stayed for generations in disgrace banished from their rightful place in the temple. But in good time along came Jeremiah, and according to him, while he was still young, God spoke to him. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, Jeremiah, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Wow, (laughs) cool. (laughs) Jeremiah must have thought, that type of message of God could really start to go to your head. Jeremiah could reclaim the honor of his family, and God called him and gave him a most important post. I was appointed not just a prophet to my own people, but to the world. God has set me apart. I will tell the world God's thoughts. I am blessed by God. My family will be so proud. We'll return to Jerusalem with our heads held high. I don't think that lasted long for Jeremiah because God continued to talk to him. God wasn't finished. Do not be afraid of them, God said, for I am with you to deliver you. (laughs) Wait a minute. (laughs) That's not quite what I was hoping for, God. I know the stories of the past and how those who were called by God were respected and everyone listened to them. I've heard the stories of my ancestors. This is starting to sound a lot more like task you give to Amos, not to Nathan. (laughs) But God wasn't done with poor Jeremiah because the next thing God said to him, now I have put words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to pluck up and pull down, to destroy and overthrow, and then to build and to plant. Whew, that didn't sound so good. Because I think at the beginning, when Jeremiah was still young, he didn't quite yet understand how hard it would be to proclaim justice to the world. I think he was just too young to understand what God's justice would cost because it's never free. Justice, God's justice, is always expensive. You can say that with me. God's justice is always expensive. And I was thinking about Jeremiah, and it was the weekend of Martin Luther King, and I began to wonder, I wonder if King ever had words to say about Jeremiah. And he did. 
After all, both of them were called to birth justice into a world that were, would prefer not to hear it. So here's what seminarian King wrote about prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah is a shining example of truth that religion should never sanction the status quo. This, more than anything else, should be enculturated into the minds of modern religionists. For the worst disservice that we as individuals or churches can do to Christianity is be sponsors and supporters of the status quo. How often has religion gone down, chained to status quo, the status quo it aligned itself with, end quote. King seemed to know already in seminary that justice was expensive. And we all know why it's costly. It's costly because it challenges those things that people don't want exposed or talked about, let alone changed. I invite you to look up. You see those big wooden pillars? They hold up the walls and they look immovable. That's usually what the status quo feels like. I could push on them and whack on them and yell at them all I wanted to, and they'd still be there. I could push on them all day and night, and the only thing that would happen is that I would be really tired. You would think your dean was crazy, and they would still be there. That's what happens. That's what Jeremiah was facing, the pillar that would not be moved. That's what Dr. King was facing when others spoke about, when he spoke out about segregation and the Vietnam War. That's what we are up against when we yell Black Lives Matter. That's what we are up against when we declare that women were created by the Lord God and should be treated the same as men both in the world and, dare I say it, in the pulpit. It's what we're up against when we declare that our justice system is irreparably broken. We are challenging those pillars of privilege, the pillars that are held in place by powerful forces, and we can too can feel on so many days like we're not making a bit of difference in the world. Poor Jeremiah, his job was to constantly try to move the pillars in his world and to do that, he first had to pluck up and pull down. He had to destroy and overthrow. And boy, was his job tough. First, when he started talking to the people in Jerusalem, I'm sure they just thought he was crazy. And then he was annoying. And then he was dangerous. And finally, he was seen as an enemy to the king and even to his own friends. Now, the scripture doesn't tell us how many days or years pass between Jeremiah 1 and Jeremiah 20. We don't know. But what we do know is that being God's prophet was very, very hard on Jeremiah. And I have a feeling when he hit chapter 20, he had had one of those days or weeks or years, and he had had it not up to here, not up to here, but pretty much up to here. And he had no one to yell at but God. So he walks up, says to God, Oh, Lord, you, you have enticed me and I have been enticed. You have overpowered me and you have prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all day long. Everybody mocks me. For whenever I speak, I must cry out, I must shout to them violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become a reproach to me all day long. If I say I will not mention God or speak any more in God's name, then within me there is something like a burning fire that's shut up in my bones, and I'm weary and I can't hold it in. <clears throat> I hear them whispering all the time, terror, terror all around, let us denounce him, let us denounce him. All my close friends are waiting for me to stumble. 
Perhaps he can be enticed and we can prevail against him and then we can take our revenge. <sighs> yet, yet, the Lord is with me like a dread warrior. Therefore, someday my persecutors will stumble. And I know they won't prevail. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O oh, Lord of hosts, you test the righteous. You see the heart and mind. Let your retribution be upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord. Praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the evildoers. Wow. Over the years, this is one text that has made an awful lot of scholars very, very uncomfortable. For those of you that preach the lectionary, it never shows up. In fact, some scholars even come to the point of saying, they think that Jeremiah is close, if not over the line, to being blasphemous. But you all have had me an intro. And you know that I will ask the question, if it's in the scripture, then how can it be blasphemous? It's there. Jeremiah is not only allowed to say the words to God, to throw them in God's face, but he's never rebuked by God for doing so. Jeremiah is expressing his frustration at the evil of the world and how it seems to be winning. Sound familiar? And he wants to quit. He doesn't want to be a prophet anymore. He's done. He's finished. He's mad at God. He's not going to talk in God's name anymore, but he can't stop. He was consecrated for the task, and no matter how hard the road, Jeremiah has learned that he must proclaim God's truth even when it hurts him. He cannot stand by silent as the poor are trampled and the widows starve. He's one of those people who simply cannot ignore injustice. According to him, God's word of justice burns in his bones. And he has to let it out. He can't keep his mouth shut. But every once in a while, he's got to expect, express his frustration. His frustration at the state of the world. His frustration that nothing's going right. His frustration that no one seems to listen to him his frustration that he's watching the world go to hell in a handbasket. And he seems to have no power to stop it. And what happens to him? Well, guess what? In the next chapter, he's back at work. Back proclaiming God's justice in the same squares he did the day before, despite the fact that he was so angry and wanted to quit. So no. Jeremiah's words aren't blasphemous, but they are a testament to how hard it is on the souls of the ones who are called to be the midwives of God's justice in this world. The world was shocked, absolutely shocked, when Mother Teresa wrote about her doubts about God and the arrival of God's justice. Well, there's not a preacher of truth that didn't understand exactly how Mother Teresa felt because on many days it just feels like it's never going to happen. God's preachers of justice are never surprised because they know that justice comes at a high cost for the ones who proclaim it and for the people who work to dismantle the pillars of the status quo. It will never be easy. I'm always amazed when I see pictures of Martin Luther King. He always looks so composed. 
in the face of people screaming at him. He looks like the most serene person in the world. But even King told us that many of his nights were spent on his knees, crying out about his doubts and his fears and his exhaustion and his frustration that nothing ever seemed to change. Justice is hard on those called to proclaim God's truth to the nations. Even in his most famous speech, he speaks of it. I am not unmindful that some of you have come here out of great trials and tribulations. Some of you have come fresh from narrow jail cells. Some of you have come from areas where your quest for freedom have left you battered by the storms of persecution and staggered by the winds of police brutality. King like Jeremiah knew what justice cost. But in both of them, there was always a word of hope. For Jeremiah, it's buried in this painful lament as if the lament somehow talks Jeremiah into realizing that even in the darkest times, God is still great and worthy of praise. With his frustration spent, he finally cries out that we should sing to the Lord and praise the Lord. (sighs) Jeremiah is also a preacher of hope because his frustration and his greatest hope are the same thing. God has shown Jeremiah the world as it should be. A world where the poor are not hurt by systems of government. A world where a dream can grow into a reality. A world where the words of Jeremiah and of Dr. King at the Lincoln Memorial again become a reality in our world. Justice is expensive. It's expensive because it often leads to social divisions and riots, as we've seen. It is expensive because as justice works through the country, states accused of gerrymandering will have to spend millions of dollars to fix their congregational maps again. Justice will be expensive because health care for all is a long battle that will cost this country trillions of dollars. Justice is expensive because those with power and privilege will never give it up without a fight. Justice is expensive because, let's face it, we are stiff-necked people, and the pillars of the status quo are thick and strong. But it's not a fight, just in darkness. I think Jeremiah and all the prophets of the ancient days and today knew that God's justice was expensive because it's the most precious thing in our world and it's the only thing worth having. When these mortal bodies pass away, God's justice will remain. Justice is expensive because it's rare. Justice is expensive because we have to fight for it. Justice is expensive because we have to believe in a vision that we cannot see. Justice is expensive because it's the only thing that matters. God's justice bursts all good things in our world, for with it come love and mercy and human dignity. Those are the pillars of God's status quo. I'll say that again. Justice, mercy, love, and human dignity are the pillars of God's status quo. It may not feel like it every day, but we are blessed to be called to this task. We are blessed to be, be the ones that have to beat our fist against the pillars of this world. We may become discouraged sometimes. We may yell, even at God. But... Old Jeremiah and all of the other saints who have gone before us will reach down through the ages and tell us to yell as much as we want at the lack of progress in our world and then get back to work. Amen and amen. Let us stand for our hymn. Bye.
are called by God to preach the truth. We are called by God to demand justice of a world that does not want to change. Be of good courage, my friends. Trust in God. Hold strong to that faith. And may the shalom of the Almighty God, the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the life-changing, world-transforming power of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Amen.